Uh, dear participants, I wish to welcome you all to this um, uh, webinar hosted by a European Federation for Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, EFLM, and particularly by the Working Group for Distance Education, represented here by the young uh, member, uh, Daniel Reidel. My name is uh, Anna Maria Shimundic. I'm uh, the chair of the EFLM Working Group on Prenatal Phase. And it is now my pleasure to announce our speaker for today, Chell Granquist, who is a professor and supervising consultant of clinical chemistry at Umea University in Sweden. He performed his PhD studies on experimental diabetes parallel to medical studies. After specialist training, he headed the University Hospital Laboratory and led it very successfully to accreditation. Uh, today, he is a director of the Department of Biobank Research and is also chairing the Laboratory Medicine Advisory Board of the County Council. His research interest is on experimental and epidemiological cancer research, but he has also supervised four PhD students on their studies on preanalytical errors and how to improve preanalytical practices. And this is why we have him here today as a speaker. He's also a member, a very good member, of the EFLM Working Group for Preanalytical Phase. He will, in his presentation, he will talk about advantages of observational studies on preanalytical analytical practices uh, with the EFLM study, one study that we recently published as in a good example of that, and um, why when they are combi combined with evidence-based methods for implementation of guideline adoption, they can be an efficient way to implement and sustain good pre-analytical guideline practices and increase patient safety. So I'm sure you will enjoy this uh, presentation by Chell Granquist. And Chell, please take over the microphone. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that everybody can hear me. Um, my um, presentation today is uh, how we actually can manage the quality in the pre-analytical phase. And uh, as you know, there's a lot of problem to uh, get that functional and working, and uh, uh, there are actually ways uh, to do it. And I'll, show, I'll try to sh show you my views on how you can manage the pre-analytical phase. So uh, let's head into this and see where we get. I'll start first with the, with the clinical practice guidelines to recall that are, they, they aim to guide healthcare staff in decision making and they, they uh, are a part of the professional quality system and uh, it aims to standardize all medical care, raise the quality and re reduce patients' risks. And to remember, which is very important, that there are usually consensus statements on best available practice. They are the practice guidelines uh, and the steps in them are often not uh, evidence-based. And then ca that can lead to discussion and uh, different kinds of recommendations too. And here is the guideline we're working with, mostly the phlebotomy practice guideline that we have worked in, in the pre-analytical group, working group. And uh, there are other, also other guidelines, for instance, locally issued guidelines, how you send the samples and how you perform other steps in the pre-analytical phase. And they, of course, has to be included too. But we'll take this guideline as an example. And here is the, the steps uh, outlined of the CLSI uh, guideline, different practice steps. And you can see there's a lot of them and they have to be followed in the consecutive order. And I'll show you examples from these different steps later on. But you are, I guess, I, you are all familiar with, with those guidelines. There are, however, some drawbacks with this guideline, practice guideline. Uh, first, as I said, there are few practice steps that are evidence-based. They're most often con consensus-based. They are very comprehensive and extensive, several pages. They contain a lot of chronological practice steps, and all of them can, of course, be made in a in a wrong way. There are numerous practice steps, as you saw. They are difficult to remember, and uh, they can be forgotten or missed. And also, 
this guideline it's limited to the collection procedure and there are also other steps as i said and if you look at the different steps they are from being being a, a clinical biochemist they are first to a large extent focus on patient and collect the safety at the collection and and not which uh, i consider also important not on the overall effects of a bad quality samples on page, patient safety which we may be also should uh, we should focus more on it does not contain the risk uh, risk evaluation of the different uh, practice steps they are all considered equal uh, of equal importance and also these guidelines, they almost all the guidelines, uh, healthcare practice guidelines, they lack evidence how to best implement and sustain the practices commended by the guideline. So they are ac ac actually uh, not stated in the guidelines how you best implement it, which I think uh, is very important as there are um, evidence-based implementations uh, known and that, sh that should of course apply to these guidelines too. So I think it's, it should be written down in the guidelines. If we then look at the pre-analytical letters in the laboratory, and I have worked in several laboratories, and uh, on, in all those laboratories, we have monitored and registered and tried to address the, the pre-analytical errors that we have discovered. And they often randomly distributed and they are infrequent. And they come from different departments and uh, different kind of errors, different steps. And uh, if you try to correct one step in one department, the next day, uh, same step or another uh, error is, uh, is uh, discovered and registered. And uh, this is a very inf inf efficient way of uh, coping with the errors because we just register and try to do something about them and nothing happens the error frequency does not go down and typically if you look at the at the figure then the registra registration of errors occurred errors are typically very low around one percent or even lower if you accumulate all errors that you see from wards and primary health care centers the, the error frequency is very low so you cannot c compare the, the error frequency of the watch to its other and you have very difficult to uh, try to do th something about it because you have to go down to the ward level to to educate people to perform bet better with the the bottom steps, for instance. So at, at best, you can compare labs between uh, each other. And this is done, for instance, in several natural societies. You compare the labs, uh, for instance, for hemolysis frequencies of the uh, test tubes and uh, also a lot of other uh, errors, patient ID errors and so on. And these frequencies are very low. And... Um, it's also very hard to do something about the errors. Even if you compare between labs, you you have to actually go out in the healthcare environment and try to correct the errors in each lab, and that's very difficult. But most of the national programs are constructed this way, and also the IFCC working group of laboratory errors and and the patient safety work this way, but I don't think it's a very efficient way of doing it. So I'll try to give me my view. And the basic idea is to increase the frequency of errors and try so we can cope with them. So the errors are not effectively managed. We don't get an increase or a decrease in error rates. So the patient safety is still jeopardized. And it's also difficult to modify staff behavior to conform to this pra practice guidelines then, of course. If it was easy, then we would have better error frequencies. And one reason for, for the difficulty is that we do not apply the method for measuring practice adherence. We, we register errors that we detect, as I said previously. And as I said, also with modifying staff behavior is uh, there are evidence based uh, publications on that, how you effectively learn people how to conform and do the practice uh, correctly. 
so the, there's a lot of evidence based on what to do. And we, of course, we should uh, apply these methods also uh, in pre-analytical practices. And here's a, some publication. I think that the best one is this by Grimshaw and collaborators that you can read and, and enjoy. And there are several others too. Now I try to summarize them in this slide. The evidence-based factor for improving guideline adoption is first that the evidence should be there that the context is accessible to change. And as, then we also must have appropriate monitoring and feedback mechanism. And uh, then we are at the ward uh, primary health care level. We have to go down there to uh, find the practice errors and uh, have the possibility to give, to give feedback at that uh, healthcare level. And we also have to give personnel available time for discuss the findings and solve the problems by themselves with help of instructors. So we're down to the ward level to re really be able to do something about the problems. The ward level is also very important and there have been no publication on that. We, we recently did that. We, we uh, uh, tried to find uh, as, uh, or calculate on the association between, between the workplace affiliation and the phlebotomy practice. And as you see from the conclusion, uh, uh, first line there, that the workplace, the workplace uh, explain about 40% of the variances. Uh, in uh, in uh, pre-analytical practices. So it's a very important to get down to the workplace uh, level if you're trying to cope with the problems and over the with the errors. So that's important. You cannot uh, manage it easily from the lab, but, but you have to have education down on the hospital ward or primary health care center level. Uh, the way to do this is to, uh, to increase the frequency so we can do something about it. And uh, one way is to look at the practices, the phlebotomists, when they, for instance, uh, collect the blood samples, if they do the uh, guideline steps correctly or not. And uh, as uh, the error frequency is uh, rather high on each individual step, then you get the high frequency of errors that you can actually uh, have, document, and uh, work with and try to correct. Uh, so here you have the tool, the high error frequency, and you have direct feedback from this, uh, studying this practice non-adherence, and you can correct correct the practices. And uh, in this way, if, for instance, if you can, can compare the different wards between each other and primary health care centers with its, which is other, and also if you accumulate this uh, practice non-adherence frequency up to the lab level, you can compare the labs to each other also. So if you have high frequency of error registration, then you can go down to the ward level and you can use this in all levels of healthcare. And also if, as this uh, non practice uh, observations or practice frequencies done on in individual phlebotomists, uh, then you can even compare the individual phlebotomists uh, to each other. So it's really on all healthcare levels that you can correct the practice errors. So uh, by doing this, we can uh, measuring the practice errors and and uh, use them as uh, quality indicators instead of register during the, the error frequency discovered at the lab. And there are two uh, possible ways to do that's uh, rather uh, easily be easily applied in healthcare. It's uh, uh, first is questionnaire on pre-analytical practices and questionnaires are often used in in healthcare, but uh, I have not seen any, very few uh, at least in the pre-analytical practices. And the other one is observational studies. And by, by using questionnaires and observational studies, you get this high frequency. So you can go down to the ward level and correct uh, practice errors. And regarding questionnaires, we have one validated questionnaire that we have used for uh, maybe 10 years now and it published in 2012. And questionnaires sur surveys are 
have several benefits. They are practical to handle. Uh, you can uh, send them out. One people can send out several hundred questionnaires and get them back and then cal calculate on the frequency of how people, phleboptomists, for instance, respond to the questions. You can reach a large study group in a large geographical area with, without much cost. But when you use questionnaire, it's very important to confirm that they are valid, how, they, how well they measure what you're supposed to measure, and they are re reliable. That means that they can be repeated and you get the same answer. And this is, uh, you have to develop them and try them out if you're going to use them. But we try this, uh, this questionnaire that has been published and done uh, a lot of publications on that. And the questionnaires, they ask questions to the phlebotomist, for instance, how do you usually perform? And then they are supposed to, to give the correct answer. And if they don't, then, it's correct, then we have uh, frequencies to work with and correct. So it's rather simple questions, but they have to be validated and test this out. So here are some, some frequencies from uh, two theses. And here we see the error frequencies are much higher than registered errors. And on each uh, primary health care centers and the hospital boards, you can, you can uh, register the high, high error frequency and then uh, try to uh, improve the error frequencies. For instance, here we have one investigation on hospital ward, wards that 20% uh, of the phlebotomists were found to label test tube after sampling and away from the patient. And uh, only 18% uh, report to, to use updated online guidelines. They, they had papers so where they looked instead. And 10% stated that they did not always compare patient ID also, and so on. And then the primary healthcare uh, center, some other issues, for instance, only 12% released states as soon as possible. So 88% did not do it. So it needed a lot of improvement to get that practice step correct. And also, which we, which we have focus on, phlebotomists should always uh, use name and identification number for co correct uh, patient ID and just about half of them stated that they always did that. And uh, the other phlebot phlebotomist did not and so on. So we have very high frequencies on uh, primary health care center and wards to work with. Then we get the other method to uh, work with this high frequency of errors is observational studies. And we did that within the working group uh, of pre-analytical pre working group. And we tried to identify the most critical steps of the CLS, CLSI guidelines. And we also created a risk occurrence chart and that was to grade the error risks instead of all uh, practice steps being equal. We tried to look how dangerous they were and try to grade that. And we did this on uh, 336 uh, uh, observations in uh, outpatient phlebotomy units, hospital wards, and also in the emergen emergency department. And when you have 336 uh, or, or, uh, audits, you have, uh, you of course, get the rather exact frequency of the different, how much the errors are in each, each uh, uh, for the bottom step. So we started with using a structured st checklist, including the old practice steps on the CSLI guidelines. We made a risk occurrence chart, and that was from the observed practice error frequencies. We just transferred that. And also we ranked the severity of harm. And uh, could you do a risk occurrence uh, chart after that? I'll show you soon. So here's the checklist, rather easy observation. In the upper part of the checklist, you have the observer's name, and he or she observes the phlebotomist and then checks uh, the different practice steps, question one, two, and three, so on, and uh, just check out is, is this done correctly or not, and uh, continue with the next 29 steps.
for instance, question four is, which I will give, get back to, uh, did the collector identify the patient according to the CLS gu guidelines or local guidelines, right or wrong? So it's rather an easy checklist to fill in. And uh, the, as the phlebotomy is take, just take a few minutes, you can, an, an observer can cover a, lo a lot of phlebotomists and the collection each hour. So you, you can collect a rather a large amount of data without a very large uh, effort. Go out to the wards and other places to, to see how, how the phlebotomists perform. And here's a compilation of the observed error frequencies. And uh, for instance, for question four regarding a p patient ID, we can see that about 16% uh, did not had, have a correct patient identification. And for question 26, that uh, about 30% of the observed phlebotomists, uh, there was a not correct uh, labeling, labeling. The tubes were labeled away from the patient. So you see you have very high error frequencies when you, when you do it this way and you can work with them then on the, on the, on the ward level. And here is how we just plotted the probability of occurrence. We simply took the uh, error frequency and we have that to the left where it says probability and put that into the table. And uh, we also ranked the sev severity of harm by uh, grading the different steps. If we, we in the working group thought that uh, the steps was important or not and or could give harm to the patients. So we can we rank that within the working group. And then we made this risk occurrence chart. So on the upper side you have the severity of harm from no, no harm at all to life threatening on that scale. On the, and on the y-axis uh, the frequency, the absorbed frequency of the different questions. And then we can produce this risk occurrence chart. And you see in the red field, the high risk field, we had at least four practice steps that uh, fell out into, into that field. Uh, one was um, the identification question, question four to the right with 16% uh, error frequency. And then we have the tube labeling questions 25 and 26. So we identified by doing this, we identified this, these steps to be the most uh, important in the practice step to, to try to correct. So the main idea with this right risk occurrence chart, then of course, is to try to push uh, everything down to the lower left hand corner by re reducing the frequency. So we don't have any markings in the red field. The study conclusion is that uh, observation studies are efficient and very useful to assess the compliance. And uh, we could uh, grade the error severity and make uh, produce this uh, a harm ranking of, of the guidelines. And, and we could then identify the most critical practice step needed attention. And this could, uh, of course, instead of studying uh, several uh, wards, uh, or uh, making international comparisons as we did in this study, you of course can do this for every ward. Uh, just plot in the frequency, error frequency in every ward and then you, you get this uh, chart and you can work with that, that. And the next step in the development that that is to try to cover other phase, phases of the preanalytical phase to other steps. For instance, how you send samples and how you prepare the patients and everything that is not included in the CSLI guideline. And you use that then to make a risk analysis and try to focus on the most important steps and try to change them, of course, then at the world, world and, pre, and primary healthcare level. To, to improve the frequencies or lower them when it is it's a question about the errors. So that's an idea that we can continue. And then we can use this evidence-based factors for improving guideline adoption as I talked about. 
the the overall conclusion that this if, if we use repeated uh, observational studies and uh, try to uh, find the practice error frequency we can uh, do the risk analysis and then we when we combine this with feedback discussion of reflection about, uh, among the personnel at the ward or primary healthcare center then we have a very efficient method to, to implement and sustain good guideline practices and increase patient safety. So uh, I think personally that this, this is the most use, useful method. And th these methods are applied on some labs and wards, wards uh, in different countries. So that's uh, what I wanted to say. And I, now I hope we have a nice discussion about these findings. And thank you. Thank you very much, Shell, for this uh, very nice um, uh, and very clear presentation. Um, I think there was one question in the middle of the presentation about near misses. Uh, and I've seen that Daniel has, has uh, uh, explained to the participant, but I think you, you might as well add a, a little more uh, of explanation about uh, the types of errors and what are actually near misses. Yes, uh, we usually register errors when they have occurred, but near misses is, for instance, when you perform a phlebotomy in the wrong way, but uh, but uh, it will never end up in a, an in, a, in an error. For instance, you can identify the patient, or you, maybe you you don't check the tube labeling, but uh, in ninety five point nine percent, it's. Uh, it will not happen. It will not be an error that occurs uh, that you mix up with the patient or the tubes, but it's a risk if you don't do it. So it's a kind of a, you you, um, uh, you just know that this has been done wrong, but it does not necessarily have to lead to that an error occur in the end because much is uh, corrected for, for instance, in the lab. And here in Umeå, we have about two technicians that work with that every day to correct all samples uh, that they see are uh, have missing uh, labels and things like that. So it takes a lot of effort to do this correction. But this is in the practice steps that does not necessarily lead to, to an error. Yes, thank you. Uh, for all of you who, who want to ask a question, you may you may use the, the chat uh, section uh, on your left. You can type in the question and I, I see that the questions are coming as I speak. And you can also uh, use your um, hand and use your microphone uh, if you wish and you can ask your question uh, live. Um, so there is uh, one question. Um, about the number of the data obtained from one operator, one time, five time, ten time, intraday or interday. I, I'm afraid I don't quite understand the question. Uh, Chell, do you see the, the questions on your left? Can you can you maybe try to guess yeah. or can can I'll you, scroll can you... yes, I'll scroll up so you can see it. Is it in the top of the hmm. Maybe if you uh, can uh, add some more explanation on the question, please. And we can move on to, to a second question from uh, uh, Dr. Kadamura from Salzburg. How do you perform these observations practically? How many persons do you need um, to answer a lot of questions? And how do you follow the examples within the lab? Okay, uh, regarding the uh, how you col collect uh, the errors or observe the, the observation, you use this um, uh, sheet. And if you are a trained uh, observer, you can see all the errors. It's, it's rather easy when you stand beside the uh, phlebotomist to see if uh, these practice steps are uh, correct or not. So if, if you are not used to observing the practice step, uh, you learn quite quickly and uh, you uh, see what is going wrong. It takes uh, maybe two or three minutes to make a phlebotomy. The, the problem is uh, then remember what is wrong and writing it down because you have to, to uh, mark uh, it in the questionnaire. But it is no problem to, to follow uh, and observe. 
Mm -hmm. And I know that some some uh, um, colleagues have uh, already introduced this as a regular periodical way of auditing their pre-analytical practices in their laboratories. So it is really very useful to do uh, uh, to to monitor the quality of the practices. We have another question, and I think the frustration uh, that is that comes from this question we all share. Um, a participant from Mexico City asks, which strategy is the most useful when the personnel don't want to change uh, phlebotomy practices because this is the way we have done it for years. Chels, share with us your, your <laughs> yeah. wisdom. How do yes. you do these guys? <laughs> I, I think this is a universal problem. So you have to start uh, with showing them that this is important and, and that it leads to problems for the patients and the uh, uh, extra work and extra costs. So uh, if you go down to the level, uh, to the ward level of lobotomy level and have this discussion, I think they, they are willing to change because it doesn't take that much effort. But we have tried that, for instance, here in the emergency department and it took a, a long way time to actually change the behavior, even if they they knew what what they should do. So the question is very relevant and it, it is not that easy. But if you get the consensus and they talk about it, uh, that we should really do this, then, then they change. Mm. But that, there, there, there is problem getting over that. That's, that's correct. Yeah. And maybe one, one good way is to, um, make those indicators uh, public or at least public uh, at the level of the hospital. So one yeah. clinical ward can, uh, you know, um, assess uh, the, the quality of the practices within the ward and compare it with other wards. So uh, maybe this might encourage people to, you know, become better. Don't you think so, Chel? Uh, yes, of course. And some some uh, people are intimidated by the comparison, but over, o overall, I, overall, I think that that this is a useful way. You have to do that. Yeah, yeah. benchmarking. We have another yeah. question from um, uh, Turkey. What do you think about the sigma metrics of preanalytical phase? Uh, I just uh, I don't have much experience uh, about it. I just seen the. Uh, publications on that and uh, they what they have worked on is uh, on they have worked on this uh, observed error frequency that that are very low so i don't think that uh, uh, it's it's not so useful it, you don't have to uh, recalculate it to the sigma mm -hmm. uh, you can just take the error frequencies because people understand that Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking to them, you make the comparisons very easily with with using percentage of errors, mm -hmm. or or better, you the the way you have, how much you have improved. Yeah, thank you. Um, so th there is now the explanation um, uh, of the question that we wanted to. Um, uh, read in the very beginning of, of the discussion, the data obtained from the operators are obtained in the same day of the interview or by several days. Um, so it's, it's not actually the interview, it's more the uh, observation. And the question is actually, do, we, do you observe the, the, the practice on the same day or is it spread over several days? Uh, I think the most important thing is to get uh, collect uh, uh, enough. Uh, if you are on a ward level, collect enough uh, uh, observations so you can make a frequency calculation. So if you just observe ten collections, then you're not sure about, about the exactness of the error frequency. So we have to increase that. Uh, the easy thing with it, it takes it does not take so much time for a observer to do this because the phlebotomists they are quite quick so if you have if you have uh, uh, for instance a phlebotomist station and you observe the collectors then you got you, you get a lot of data in one day mm -hmm. so we had uh, our technicians here when we did the study she she did uh, 32 observations in i think it was several words in the same day so we, she just went around, around and, and got the data 
So, uh, so it's an easy way of obtaining the error frequency and giving the feedback to to, to mm -hmm. each word if, if mm -hmm. it's the difference. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question for you. You've, in, in the beginning of your presentation, you've said that most of the steps are actually focused on the uh, patient safety or the operator safety or the phlebotomist safety and uh, not very much of those steps are actually related to the quality of the sample. Uh, what do you think are, are the steps um, within the venous blood sampling procedure which are the most critical to the quality of the sample? Which steps would you uh, um, identify as the most critical? Oh, that's a good question. I have not dug into that. But the, the most, uh, regarding the sample quality, I think that uh, you have to release the stasis and uh, avoid uh, hemolysis because hemolysis is the, the main problem for a clinical laboratory. It causes the uh, most problem with the, uh, for, for the analysis of the sample quality. So if you cannot avoid hemolysis, uh, that's good. And hemolysis also occurs when you're transporting the samples. So there's, there's, there's some uh, important uh, practice steps that you have to improve to ensure that the sample quality is correct. But there's a lot of, there are a lot of steps also that does not affect the sample quality. So if you're just looking at that, maybe depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Turkey. What do you think about phlebotomy teams? Are there phlebotomy teams in every EU country? Well, I can tell you there are no phlebotomy teams in Croatia. And what about Sweden, Chell? No, there there are not. So it, it depends on the country. Mm. So in in Norway, for instance, they have a very efficient organization with the laboratory technicians uh, collecting all samples. So. We can we can be uh, uh, envious on 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 Norway for that because they have dedicated staff doing that, mm -hmm. so the error frequency is low too. But uh, if you have phlebotomy team, then you have to assure that uh, they are doing the right things because that's also a working place and they have their own rules and uh, they they don't do everything correct. And we noted that also in our own uh, where we have our own lab where we have a small uh, collection uh, unit and uh, the technicians there, they were not the best on everything. They also made all these errors. So mm -hmm. they, were, they, was, they were slightly better than the others, but not that much. So they could uh, in, enjoy that they were very much better. They were not. So it's, it's much, it, it was much about the, the, about the workplace. You have to work with that to get everything right. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Salzburg. Which frequencies do you recommend for phlebotomist training? Um, I'm not sure that I quite, I quite understand that. How frequent you need to train phlebotomists maybe? And which kind of training is the best in your opinion? So what do you think is the best way to train phlebotomists? Is it the demo arms or the videos or lectures or what? what is according to your opinion, the best way to train phlebotomists? Uh, as I said in this presentation, I think that the observation by a trained uh, for an instructor is the best. You get the feedback directly and then you repeat that. Uh, we have made studies on that too. And uh, uh, if you do phlebotomists very often, maybe all day around, it's not uh, assured that you are better than all others. So uh, we found in that investigation that people that made uh, a few uh, phlebotomies uh, every week, they were the best at it because they, they still kept alert on what they were doing. Whereas those that collected uh, uh, blood all the day, they, they got sloppy and did not do as well. So, <laughs> so you can, you, just by high, having a high frequency, you cannot assure that it is done correctly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you. that's a strange that's a strange finding, but interesting. Yeah, there is a lot of strange things related to penalty <laughs> <process. laughs> Yeah. Now we have another question from Lima. 
Um, uh, a colleague says that in his country they observed phlebotomy personnel mistakes uh, uh, with very high frequency, for example, inadequate asepsis 80% of the time and uh, tourniquet time, I guess, too long, 81% yeah. of the time. What do you think about possible solutions to, to this problem? Well, then you have made the you have the correct method to de detect the errors, and then you ca can go down to the ward and discuss this with the with the people involved. You have to start and try to get over this barrier to that that somebody said is that we don't want to do this this because we have it done. We will will do as you as you we always have done, but you have to go down and have this discussion. And show them that it's for the benefit both for them and for the patient safety. Yeah. By education, I guess, and by showing them the evidence that you know wrong practice leads to uh, either uh, puts patient at risk or uh, jeopardizes the the quality of the sample. Yeah. And causes also the financial loss, and uh, this is something that hospital management does not. Uh, like to hear. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Toronto, which is very interesting. Um, uh, how reliable is your observation when the operators know that they are being watched? So most people will behave better when they are being watched. What do you say about it, Chow? Uh, we have a, well, my experience is that they cannot conceal that because uh, they they are honest about what when we have questionnaires they're very honest about what we're doing because when we ask them uh, one time and then repeat the questions uh, one month later they, they give the same answer and the same with observational studies why should they cheat if they if they know the, the they are doing the wrong thing they, they know what is right so i think that observational studies they, they actually reflect uh, the truth and uh, it's very hard for the phlebotomist to conceal that they are worse than they are. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Uh, the, the second question from the same participant is um, uh, how can you say that uh, the watched study can help implement practice guidelines without even knowing why certain malpractice is being done? So how can you say that your observation can help improving the quality if you don't know why they are doing it in, in a specific way? Um, I don't really understand that because if if you um, mm. observing is just I, I would say the first step as you as you said several times during this presentation yeah. observation is just the first step and it helps you to identify the errors and then you have to uh, proceed yeah. to to the second step which is go down to the ward and <laughs> talk to the uh, phlebotomist and uh, educate them and see why are they are doing some steps in in the in the wrong way Yes, thank you. You're very good at this, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I, 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 I agree with you, <laughs> of course. <laughs> thank you, presenter. Um, do we have uh, more questions? Um, if not, then um, I would read a, a message from Ivica Yoshko from Kitchener, I guess, Canada. Thank you for your presentation and regards to all attendees and special hello from my fellow Croatians, Yoshko from Canada. And um, I would like to thank to our presenter, uh, Chell Grangfist, for this wonderful um, uh, comprehensive presentation. I wish to thank to all participants for joining us. And I wish also to thank to Daniel Reidel for being such a good technical support during this webinar. Have a nice evening. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.